Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as we talk about COVID-19 here in Erie County. Today, we have two new positive cases to report in Erie County of COVID-19. Both of these cases are in their 20s, and they reside in the same home. The new cases are located in Zone 5, which will be posted on the cumulative cases map by zone at eriecountypa.gov in a few minutes. Contact tracing continues with the Erie County Department of Health staff. Our contact tracers at the Health Department have been diligently working around the clock to identify contacts of all the positive cases since the first one hit back in March here in Erie County. We have a very robust tracing system locally, and the staff has a very good handle on our list of people who have been diagnosed positive with COVID-19. And they are 100% confident with their numbers at the Department of Health here in Erie County. Having said that, our total number is now 122 cumulative positives with 2,734 negatives and 97 recovered cases thus far. An update on our surrounding counties shows Crawford County having 21 cases, McKean reporting eight cases and one death, Venango County has seven cases, and Warren County still has only one case. Chautauqua County has 43 cases and four deaths, and Ashtabula now has 193 cases and 19 deaths. And the state is reporting 57,991 cases and 3,000 806 deaths. Please continue to wear your mask when you go outside and are near anyone else who does not live with you in your home and wear it properly. We've seen many masks being worn improperly, so make sure it covers your entire nose and your mouth together. Please keep yourself at least six foot distance from anyone you come in contact with. Wash your hands with soap and water and so sanitize the surfaces that you and others touch. Now I would like to acknowledge a few of our star players, model businesses, who are doing the right thing. So our staff was out and saw Dick's Sporting Goods. Their fitting rooms are still closed at Dick's and all employees are wearing masks. They're taking returns in their lobby. The customers uh, who make those returns don't need to come into the store then. And then they let those returned items sit on a shelf for three days before they put them back out for other customers to purchase. There's a greeter at the front door who's enforcing the mask mandate, and they're allowing customers to try on shoes, but the associate gets the shoes for the customer, and if they don't purchase those shoes, then those shoes are placed on a rack, and they are left there, again, for about three to five days after having been sanitized before they return them to the shelves. There is social distancing signage throughout the store, and a manager is walking around the store cleaning high-touch areas constantly, and also observing the customers and reminding them to keep socially distanced as needed. They log their cleaning on a chart to ensure the high-touch areas are staying sanitary. So it sounds like they're just doing a great job, being a great business partner. The Cold Stone Creamery is doing uh, mostly online orders, which are prepaid, limiting the guest count to six guests in the store at any one time. They're sanitizing the freezer door handles and counters after each person is in the store. And they're not doing any sampling, sorry to say, but obviously a very good practice at this particular time. And finally, the manager took the Serve Safe COVID-19 precautions course. So thank you for doing your part um, to help keep everyone in our community safe. And thank you to the businesses who are really out there helping us to fight the spread of COVID-19 in the community, we continue to hear many, many good things, not only from our inspectors who are out, but from citizens who have reached out to tell me about the stores that they go to and how pleased they are with the different precautions that have been put in place. And now I'd like to welcome a special guest with me today, someone we haven't seen before uh, here on this uh, briefing, and that's Dr. Tony Snow. He is our Erie County Department of Health Medical Director, and I'm just so grateful that he's been willing to come on with us today. So Dr. Snow, please go ahead. Thank you very much, County Executive Dahlkepper, and thank you for asking me to come. I am delighted to be here. And firstly, I just want to extend my thank you 
to the entire Erie County community because our statistics are truly amazing. When you think of approximately a 1.6 mortality rate, when the state, the nation, and the world really is closer to five or 6%, that's extraordinary. And the reason that is so extraordinary is because of the wonderful work of our county executive, working with Mayor Schamber, the health systems, and our wonderful public health officials. And without a doubt, the community at large who have embraced the recommendations of their body of individuals. It is so important that we all take a stake in the health of our community, which affects us all. I want to give a special shout out thanks to the Erie County Department of Health. I've been the medical director for over 30 years, and in that time have come to know very well the staff at the Erie County Department of Health and I can tell you all, they are superior. They are unequaled in their commitment, their competence, and their dedication to the public health issues of the folks of Erie County. Case in point, their efforts with SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that causes the COVID-19 epidemic. And we see them working tirelessly to respond to tracking individuals, to spreading information to individuals, for teaching and seeing that individuals who are affected by this virus receive effective treatment in a timely fashion. So again, I wanna thank Ms. Melissa Lyon and her wonderful staff for what they are doing to help us be in the position we are in our county dealing with such a pandemic. I also, want to commend the Department of Health for their excellence in that, as we heard before, we only have six county departments of health in Pennsylvania and four municipal departments of health. Of the six, we are one of those who have achieved the accreditation of the Public Health Accreditation Board, the Erie County Department of Health, one of only five of the 10 in Pennsylvania. And that is a very important achievement to maintain a standard of excellence, to have the consult of experts availability, to get teaching aids and equipment and protocols in place that cause excellence in practice. So I wanted to make a big shout out and a thank you to the Erie County Department of Health for that. Secondly today, I wanna to talk about testing. I like most of the health providers in our country feel that we are really woefully lacking in our ability to test. This is not an attack on Erie County or what we are doing, but throughout the nation, it's estimated that we should and hope to do anywhere from two to three times the amount of testing we are presently doing in order to get a better handle on the impact of this COVID virus in our community. I applaud the efforts that are being done, and I think they are a great step in the right direction, but I think it is very important that we look to methods that will increase the free availability of testing to a larger segment of our population with particular sensitivity to the medically underserved populations, the populations of color, the individuals who suffer physical disabilities and the individuals suffering mental health disabilities. So we make sure that this testing is available to everyone, including those individuals who are involved in essential businesses and serving at all levels in those businesses, but who may have concerns about their health, about the fact that they may or may not be an asymptomatic carrier of the COVID virus and their concern that they may bring it to their loved ones. And thirdly, I want to just say in this time of reopening, which I like everybody else am excited to see us reach a state of a new normal, I am concerned by seeing some of the trending of increased positivity. Now that may be a consequence of increased testing, true enough, but we have to go far further in that domain. But it also unfortunately could be a consequence that although all of us are experiencing fatigue, boredom, isolation, 
economic pressure, the desire to get back to work in taking an emotional toll on us all, we cannot let the new opportunities of being deemed in the yellow zone allow us to become careless or to abandon the healthy practices that got us here. There's a tendency to feel that oh, as we are reopening, it's a brand new world and that the threats of the past have gone and they have not. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19 is alive and well in our community. And it will have a resurrection if we let down our guard. So I implore all of us to please continue to be diligent in all the things our executive County executive just said, please do not stop wearing the face coverings and wear them properly with covering our mouth and our nose because we are doing that to protect others from ourselves if we are that 20 to 50% of people who may be asymptomatic. If we all do it, none of us will spread it to anybody else. Remember the social distancing, Remember the importance of washing hands frequently because we are in contact with surfaces and may have this virus. Don't forget the importance of sanitizing and the areas of common use, be they home, car, or work. And the importance of staying home if we don't feel well. We may be in the throes of this virus and it's important to stay home so we do not spread it to others and to consult our healthcare providers so we can get treatment. With all that said, I have to say I am very proud to be in Erie County and proud of all the efforts all of you are doing. We have proved that we can make a difference when we work together, as we proved in those several weeks from March through April. As we go forward, we too can overcome the ravages of this virus by not forgetting the things we do together and by each taking individual responsibility to do our part, to look out for everyone so Erie County can continue to be healthy and safe as we go into the brave new normal. So thank you very much, Mrs. Dow Kempfer, for allowing me to speak, and I'll be more than glad to stay for questions later. Thank you so much, Dr. Snow, and thank you for your long time dedication to really the health and welfare of the citizens of Erie County uh, through your participation on the board of the Erie County Department of Health. And with that, we will go to questions from the media, and we will start with Erie Times News today. Hi, Kathy, it's David. Um, Governor Wolf yesterday had talked about, when asked about uh, yellow um, phase counties transitioning to green, that he said there's no timetable right now for that. Um, does that concern you? I'm sure that's a question people have, even though we've just turned yellow last Friday, that there appears to be no timetable for turning green. Do you have one in store, or is there anything you can share with us about what needs to happen for Erie County to go green? So I was on a call just a little bit earlier today with the uh, County um, Association of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rachel Levine was on that call, as was Governor Wolf. And uh, I asked that question. We all had to type in our questions, and I guess numerous uh, people were asking the same question to them. Uh, the response that we got was that they have not yet determined what those data points will be, and they are working on that now, but they want to get us all transitioned to yellow and, uh, and then keep on working on what the data points should be going forward. So obviously, we'd all like to know what that is. My question was, We'd like to know so that we can strive for meeting those metrics, whatever they might be. So as soon as uh, obviously they have them, we'll be glad to get them. But um, I understand that uh, this is a very complicated situation. Uh, none of us have ever been through this before, not our president, not our governor, not our local leaders. And uh, everyone is trying to do the best they can. And I know that the state is working with Carnegie Mellon and other um, academic uh, entities to try to really come up with what what the data should say in order to move us to green. So as it may be frustrating, but I, I'm excited that we're in yellow. Other counties are just moving to yellow this Friday, the ones in the Southwest, obviously over on the east side of the state, that will be later this month in early June. Um, so I think we're gonna continue to do well here. And hopefully once the green uh, metrics come out, we can see how quickly we can get to that by working collectively. 
and I just want to make sure I'm clear on what you said, Kathy, um, that will, will counties go to green before some of other ones, like in the eastern part of the state, go to yellow? Or does, did, they, did they tell you today that all counties have to at least be yellow before any go green? They didn't say that specifically, but it was, um, I, I kind of understood that to maybe be part of the discussion that they want to get everyone to yellow, but not to say that they, wouldn't, that they aren't working on what green looks like co you know, at the same time. But they do not have, uh, my understanding is, any of those metrics determined yet, or at least not put down in a, uh, a way that they can distribute that to those of us who are obviously needing to know. Uh, talk Erie. Yes, good afternoon, Kathy. It's Joel Natale. I have a question for Dr. Snow. Um, if, Dr. Snow, could you explain how you think that the outreach to the traditionally underserved populations is going as far as screening and testing? Sure. Thank you very much for the question, because that's very near to, dear to my heart, because we have to be through our entire population to make a meaningful difference. Right now, I think there are many barriers that make it very challenging for people. There's economic barriers, there's barriers of distance, there's barriers of culture. We often see barriers of language. And these all tend to cause particular impact in the medically underserved population. This, that's not to say that we don't work diligently to make a difference. I know there are efforts underway that you'll hear a lot more about later where we're trying to figure a system to make inroads into those populations to take all those barriers I just talked about and try to break them down so that people will feel comfortable, people will feel empowered to get tested in an economically beneficial way and have the knowledge to know what to do with those tests and how to protect themselves and others. So I know that's not a specific answer to your question, but it is, um, I can tell you with good faith that it's on all of our plates, that we have to have a cross section of our population, very inclusive of folks who have been medically underserved before we can really feel we're making an impact and having our hands around this virus. And part of that is increasing the amount of testing we are seeing at those at-risk populations. Because we, as we all know, there's several segments of our population across the nation that have shown to be medically underserved and disproportionately impacted by the COVID virus and what it can do. And that's what we're trying to work on locally. So there's more to come, but it's definitely not out of sight, out of mind, or unimportant. Because I feel personally that it's imperative that we do that. Thank you for the question. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Uh, I wanted to ask about the testing. We have 122 positives, 2,734 negatives. That's about a 4.27% uh, infection rate. What, how does that work? Can you explain to a layperson, you know, with somebody with all kinds of um, symptoms, how is it that still 95% of them don't have COVID? Oh, that, that's a great question. Because we have to remember that COVID, which is a SARS-CoV-2 virus, is in fact a virus. And many, many, many of the symptoms of viruses overlap. We're still in the heart of all the other viruses, including influenza, respiratory viruses, adenoviruses, and a plethora of viruses that are out at this time of year, very similar symptom complexes, and that's what makes it so tricky. You can't just say, oh, you have a cough, so you have COVID, or oh, you have a fever because you have COVID. It, it's very mixed up. So to be an effective or a screening system that we can believe in, we want to have far more screening than we have positives. That's a sign of goodness with a testing system. And I'll give you the, the example of that in a non-viral way. If an, if an ICU that took care of heart disease had 100% of the people they saw all turned out to have heart attacks, then that system would be missing people because there's got to be a lot of other people with symptoms that got by and never got tested. 
you should have far more people going to the ER with chest pain than you have turning, turning out to have a heart attack to be an effective screening. Well, it's the same with this. So that's why you get a lot of screening and not a lot of positivity on one point. And also, the other thing is it gets tricky leading back to screening. The populations, the hotspots, the people at risk have to be included in those screenings in order to make a more valid statistic of the penetration of the virus in the population. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you, Joel. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Here your news now. Hi, good afternoon. A question for Dr. Snow, if I may. Um, I've got uh, viewers emailing me, calling me left and right about this uh, business that had uh, six infected employees. And so from a medical perspective, why should or shouldn't they be concerned about having been, having been in that business um, with those in infected employees? And, and thank you for the question. I do understand it. But in medical, maybe this will help. We approach patients with what we call universal precautions. The approach we take care of patients is based on the fact that we never know who we're seeing and talking to in the office who might have tuberculosis. We never know who may have an infection or a contagious disease, but we give equal opportunity and care to everybody. To do that, we approach everybody with universal precautions. It's no different with the COVID virus. There's nowhere, I wish there was, but there's nowhere we can be where we can tell ourselves COVID's not here. I'm sitting in my home and I can't say COVID is not in this home. We also know that COVID in many of us has no symptom. So even when you screen me for my fever, that's no guarantee that I do not have COVID. We know also that in the course of an infection with every virus, including COVID, that we have a period of time where we, are, we have the virus, we have not yet even shown symptoms. We have a period of time where we are symptomatic and, and then we have a period of recovery. And in that time, at some points we're infective, some points we're not. So I say this all to say, I understand the anxiety of hearing that Tony Snow's house had, uh, he and his wife have COVID. Then everybody would want to say, oh, we can't go around there and we got to put a barrier around. Do not go close to his house because you'll get vi virus. But that wouldn't be valid because the virus I have is everywhere. And that's why we're encouraging people to all use precautions. So knowing the a business had six employees is not a red flag that that business is something terribly wrong with them or did something terribly wrong or needs to be shunned or avoided because the business next door to them that has had no known employees may be at risk and have employees for COVID either through staff or the individuals who use these, biz these businesses every day. So the safest thing to do is to take the knowledge, not of that one business, but the knowledge that COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 is alive and well in our county. So all of us should approach the county that it is everywhere we can be. And that's the safest thing we can do. And the more of us that do that would protect more and more of us from outbreaks of that infection. So I hope that answered your question. It's not about that business, but it's about the virus that's in our community everywhere. That does. Thank you, Doctor. May I follow up on that very You're very briefly? welcome. Thank you um, for the question. Is there uh, any any fear that um, you know by by not alerting people who were in the business with those infected employees is is there any reason to to fear that that, that could increase the number of asymptomatic carriers that those people could have been infected and are now out there with the disease and we wouldn't know it? I'm sorry. Was that directed at me? Yes, please, that, sir. Yes. If I may, yes. Yes. No, because we, as um, our county executives have mentioned to us, we do detailed tracking on every positive infection, every one everywhere, extremely detailed by a highly competent staff at the Erie County Department of Health. And if I 
was working at wherever I was working and an individual was found to be positive, part of that tracking would in fact identify me. I would be informed, I would be taken into the system and I'd be followed up, cared for to the max because that's part of our system, not related to one place, but related to the system of virus mitigation. Thank you. Thank you. But doctor, what about customers? Pardon me, through that in tight. Now there's several layers of exposure and all of that is taken into account. Keep in mind, customers come in, customers may have face masks, customers may be in for short times, long time, they may not have, in a large place, I could be there quite frequently and have no contact with an individual because there's other people there. So it's, it's very complicated, but believe me, the depths of that are, taken into consideration with the uh, tracking and the testing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jet TV. Yes, hi, Kathy, Samir, if I may. Uh, so I'm hearing many school districts have approached the County Health Department for guidance uh, regarding in-person commencement mm -hmm. uh, and that they're not really getting much insight to that and it's kind of, or, Part of the growing frustration with that so do you have uh, a statement on that we have had numerous conversations with numerous school districts um, over many many weeks here um, i've had conversations with all of the superintendents together through uh, zoom meetings uh, not only with myself but my staff on the environmental side and so we have engaged with our superintendents actually for a long time to try to be of assistance to them in a multitude of ways, including the graduation of their seniors. First of all, you know, um, myself having graduated at one point and knowing how important that time of your life is, um, I feel very, very deeply for these students and what this virus has done to the end of their senior year. Um, and it is, it's terrible and I feel very, very badly for them. Um, we have, again, we've spoken with the superintendents, tried to answer every question they've had, uh, given them the guidance that we have gotten coming down from the CDC and from the state. Uh, it's important to remember that a school district is its own political entity. Pennsylvania is very much um, parochial in our governments. Um, so the school district is its own freestanding political entity. County government is its own political freestanding entity. And so uh, the school district will decide what's best for them, but we have given them the guidance that we have gotten again from both the federal and the state level, as well as the knowledge and um, understanding of this virus from our own county health department. And, uh, but it's up to the school districts to make their own decisions as to what they do going forward for their students and commemorating uh, this great milestone in their life. Unfortunately, it's not going to be the way that mine was and anyone else listening who didn't graduate in 2020. And it's, it's a very, um, very difficult thing for these students to, I think, accept. And, uh, and I can understand that, you know, I'm also a mother of five and I can imagine my own children having to accept this and how hard that would be. So I, my heart goes out to them. Um, but again, it's up to each school district to decide what level of risk or what level of, um, you know, graduation and how they're going to perform that is. But to say that we aren't engaged is not true. We've been extremely engaged with all of the school superintendents for a long time. Erie Times News. Yes, Kathy, I want to go back over the, the number of recovered COVID patients you have. Um, you had mentioned it was 97 uh -huh. and we've had 122 total cases. Um, it seems like we've had a lot of very quick recoveries because you had we had 19 cases reported last Thursday and Friday, six over the weekend and two today. That's 27 just just there, you know, just since last Thursday. Are we seeing patients making very quick recoveries? And, and what what is the definition of a recovered patient, according to the county? So, you know, um, uh, Dr. Snow may be able to address some, some of this from a medical standpoint of recovered. Um, but you need to be 72 hours past your last symptom, and then you are in the recovered phase. Um, so if you remember, we had sort of a low count for 
a while before we had that fairly large spike. And so that may be why we're seeing more recovered. And, and I think the recovery, from what I understand, again, I'm not a medical doctor, but my understanding is that some people do recover fairly quickly. Um, it may depend on when they actually got tested, too, um, or when we got the results of their tests. Because I've been talking all along that some people's tests are coming back within 24 hours, but other people's tests sometimes take two or three. In the beginning, it was sometimes even five days. Um, we're, we're doing better with that. So if someone had symptoms and then by the time they go get tested and that test goes in and maybe it is a few days, in the meantime, you know, once you take the test, you are told right away that you need to stay isolated. Um, so even before you know for sure if you're positive or negative, you're told that. So that person may have been isolated and then they get the positive result. So they already may be halfway through their recuperation from the um, disease. And the other thing I'm going to uh, say I might suspect, but again, I would love to, Dr. Snow to weigh in on this. We have trended much more onto the young side for our positive cases than we've seen historic or uh, typically happening across the Commonwealth and across the country. Um, many people in their 20s and 30s, teens even, and, and um, you know, so they're usually a little more healthy and vibrant, and, and maybe they were just recovering faster because of that younger age. But maybe Dr. Snow would like to weigh in on this. I'd love to hear his thoughts. Sure. Sure. I think you're right and on the money, um, Mrs. Val Kemper, when you say that. And I agree with you. We know that the COVID going its rounds is a two to three week phenomena usually provided the complications don't set in. So depending where in that spectrum I was tested, I will be equally positive. But one time I'm positive and I'm getting ready to get into the thick of the illness. At another point I'm positive and I'm recovering from the illness. So that all goes to the time that I will have in fact achieved 72 hours of asymptomatic afebrile state and been part of the recovery. You're quite exactly right that that's, that's part of that phenomena that makes that happen. And you're right, with the younger population, and this can be with the younger population does Snow fare better as a rule, except for the very young children. Go ahead, um, David. I'm sorry, go right ahead with your yeah, question. If, the if, if the someone has it, is tested positive, but doesn't have any symptoms at all, does the 70, how does the 72 hour um, rule apply to that? And that can either be you, Kathy, or Dr. Snow. What we do. When we see a positive individual who is asymptomatic, we encourage a 14-day isolation. We're not sure where they are in it. They're asymptomatic now. Will they be symptomatic in three days? Are they at the beginning of their course? Will they be symptomatic in a week? We think the illness itself tends to get better over that 14-day period. So we ask for a 14-day isolation, a quarantine, if you will, if I'm asymptomatic and positive, and then provided through that period of time I have not developed any symptoms, then we consider that it was in fact an asymptomatic involvement that is no longer contagious. I'd also like to mention too that tomorrow we're going to have Val Bukowski from our epidemiology team on as my guest. And I think some of the questions that um, you've been putting forward in the last few days particularly, she will probably be able to give you a much a better scientific answer and, and give you some real details on how things are done. So I think that would be really helpful tomorrow, having Val here to be able to answer some of these things for um, those listening and watching. Uh, Takiri? Kathy, yes, I wanted to ask you about if there was any um, hints on what green would look like. I'm, I, I'm, I guess I'm not so concerned about the timeline, but what it would look like. Are, are we talking about large gatherings? Are we talking about the mall opening? Are we still talking about universal masking before a, uh, you know, we get some kind of vaccine or something like that? Do they give you any hint about greed? They gave us no hints. And um, the only thing that I suspect and have heard something is that really they're, almost all businesses will be able to be open but again, I can't say that's for sure or not. They really did, had no details for us today. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh, sure. Erie News Now? Question for Dr. Snow. 
What goes through your mind as we move to this yellow phase? You certainly see a lot more people out and about, roads busy or parking lots at stores full. Uh, from a medical perspective, from someone with such a, a strong grasp on this disease and how it spreads, um, what concerns, if any, do you have um, seeing that sort of stuff as we transition? Thank you for the question. I do have concerns. And while we're talking about this color-coded reopening system, I, I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news, but it's fluid. We evaluate it. It's constantly under evaluation. And there were criteria that were met to go from green to yellow. But on, we have to not clear our minds of the fact that criteria can go from yellow, I mean, from red to yellow. Criteria can go from yellow to red. That's what worries me. We're watching these numbers. Keep in mind the trajectory of infection that we have followed and the amount, and they had some population statistics on the amount per population, et cetera, that made this happen. But if there's a resurgence because of a lot of factors, including perhaps more testing will identify more, perhaps a certain lack of our same diligence, not wearing our masks, getting together. We all are hungry for social uh, experiences, for dealing with our loved ones and our friends. But as we do that, we're opening up the possibilities for a resurgence of the virus. So what worries me is the fact that we're very, very early in our yellow phase um, duties and responsibilities. And I just am worried that we'll be so delightful to see things open up that will say, good, we made it, it's over, and it could have a resurgence. That would have an extremely, not only a physically deleterious effect on those involved, which of course we all care about, but it would be mentally devastating as we're in a mode of freedom, opening up and, re and getting back to the world to find it was necessary to close down or retrench would be devastating. And that's a worry I have. If we all don't keep diligent and keep up our guard, remembering we're doing it for ourselves and we're doing it for each other, and we're doing it to attain that social freedom, that economic freedom that we so desire, we can do it more quickly by being diligent. Where if we're careless and we start seeing big numbers resurging, there will be a health-related clampdown, and that's what I worry about. Thank you, Dr. Snow. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jet TV. Yes, hi, Kathy. Samir again. So looking to other states that are kind of uh, slowly reopening, they've some have already uh, reopened a little bit more. Of course, like we know, Ohio with the hair salons, et cetera, and restaurants allowing guests inside. So I guess, what is your thoughts overall on the Commonwealth's approach to this uh, reopening phase? Do you think we're taking a little too slow, or is it more of a slow and steady wins the race? Uh, personally, I do believe that um, the Secretary of Health and the governor are taking a very measured approach because they truly care about trying to save lives in, in the Commonwealth and keep people safe and healthy and understanding there's, there are trade-offs, and so they're trying to move this along. But I do con get concerned when I see some states that have uh, really opened the door to uh, many different practices where you cannot keep socially distant no matter what you do in terms of that particular activity. And, um, and there could be a fairly large resurgence in those areas, but time will tell and we will all see how that works out with those states. Um, but I, I have to say that I've been in agreement um, pretty much with, this, with the way the state has progressed through these phases. Uh, Could I also get a reaction from Dr. Snow about that? Yes, sir. I totally agree with Mrs. Dalkemper. We're talking about lives and we're talking about people. And I do believe in being as conservative as possible for something as precious as a life and well-being. And so I am very supportive of the approach we're taking in Pennsylvania. Thanks. Thank You're you. Welcome. Well, I'm going to end the questions there today. Um, it's uh, almost 45 minutes, and actually I'm supposed to be getting on a call shortly with the federal government to talk about testing and increasing testing across the country, so I want to make sure that I get on that call and hear 
what we need to hear from Erie County from a federal perspective, so I appreciate that. Uh, but before I close today, I want to highlight the Erie Art Museum and its new virtual tour that launched this week. The museum has held paint night online and open mic poetry nights. Uh, they are featuring artists who submitted to their annual spring show on their Facebook page. And because visitors aren't able to go to the museum, you can have Erie Multimedia, you can go on a virtual tour created by Erie Multimedia. And this can be found at erieartmuseum.org backslash virtual tour. So follow them on Facebook, visit them online for more information and another one of our great assets here in Erie County trying to help all of us get through this pandemic and give us the arts while we do. While we do. So in the meantime, please try to stay home as much as you can. Please remember to stay safe and please stay calm. Thank you, Dr. Tony Snow, for joining me today. You've been a great guest, full of great information, and I appreciate you being with us. Thank you all.